Now in Exodus chapter 3, of course, we're reading the familiar story about Moses meeting with God at the burning bush out of the wilderness. He's being sent to go to Egypt to deliver the people out of bondage. They're all enslaved in Egypt. They've been there for about, you know, almost 400 years. And so Moses is going to be the deliverer that's going to take them out of there. Now, if you would, look at, the, look at Acts chapter 7. Okay, keep your finger back in Exodus. We're going to get back there. But look at Acts chapter 7. I want to read you a little bit of another perspective on this story from the New Testament, where Stephen is basically recapping this when he's preaching in Acts chapter 7. Look at verse 22 of Acts chapter 7. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. So now you remember that Moses, of course, was you know born in a time when Male children were not allowed to be born among the Hebrews, and they were actually killing the young children, throwing them into the Nile River and, and doing that wicked thing of, of uh, infanticide. Well, he grew up to be, you know, three months old. They hid him in a basket. They put him in the Nile River, and he went floating down the river in a basket. Pharaoh's daughter was washing herself. His sister Miriam was watching to see what would become of the child. And Pharaoh's daughter finds the child, pulls him out. He's crying. She had compassion on the baby. And they took Moses, and uh, basically he was nursed by his mother and lived with his mother, his real mother, for the first two years of his life. And when he was weaned, he became, you know, basically the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Well, he lived in that system. He grew up in Egypt until he was 40 years old. Okay, so he lived from the time he was, you know, 2 to 40. And look what it says. It says he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. I mean, he went to their schools. He went to their university. You know, he got all the training. He was very, very educated in their ways. And it says in verse number, and it says he was mighty in words. What does that mean? He was a very good speaker. I mean, he was an eloquent speaker. And he was mighty in deeds. And it says and when he was full 40 years old, verse 23, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed, this is the key, he supposed that his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, you are brethren, why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me? Is thou did as the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at the saying, was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him, and this is where we're at in the story, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. And Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from, off, from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Now, all that reading is the introduction, and I want to preach this subject. Send someone else. You know, this was Moses' attitude. Send somebody else. Now, when we were back in uh, Exodus 3, he began to make excuses when God wanted to send him, and God was dead bent on sending him to be the one to deliver the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Even 40 years previously, the Bible teaches that God had already chosen him. Now, he went about it the wrong way. The people weren't ready. I don't know if they weren't being oppressed bad enough. They weren't, their bondage wasn't bitter enough yet. But they became indignant when Moses tried to lead some kind of an uprising. You know, it was premature. And what happened was, he was rejected by the people. They did not want him as a ruler. They did not want him as a judge. They did not want him as a deliverer. So he had to go and wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And he went and dwelt in Madian. He began to herd sheep. And uh, he met a man named Ryu. His father-in-law, Ryu, gave him one of his daughters, Zipporah, to be his wife. So he basically just settles down in the wilderness. He marries Zipporah. He has a couple of sons. And he's just kind of living his life and going about his life. Well, God wasn't going to let him go. God came back to him when he's 80 years old and says to him, I'm going to send you. I want you to go and deliver my people out of the land of Egypt. Look at the excuses. Are you in Exodus 3? 
he basically gives five different uh, protests, five different excuses. The first excuse is in chapter 3 when he says, you know, who am I? Who am I that I should deliver the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt? Then the next thing is, he says, well, I don't know what to tell them your name is. You know, in verse 13 and 14, they're going to ask me what your name is. I don't even know your name. You know, so he just keeps making up all these different reasons why he's not going to go. Then look at uh, chapter 4, verse number 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto me. So this is the third time he's protesting and making an excuse. He's saying, Well, they're not going to believe me. Okay, look at his next uh, excuse. Look at verse 10. And Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord. I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Now, is that really true? No, the Bible says he was mighty in words and deeds. He was a very eloquent man, but he's just making excuses. Then, this is where God really gets upset. Okay, his last excuse in verse 13, he basically just says, O Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And on and on, he begins to protest to him. You see, Moses is trying to say, hey, send someone else. First he said, well, you know, I, I'm not good enough for the job. Then he said, well, I don't even know what your name is. Then he said, well, they're not going to believe me. Then he said, I'm not eloquent. And then he just said, well, just send somebody else. So somebody else is going to do it. But you see, what Moses didn't understand is that if he didn't do it, no one else was going to do it. Look at Ezekiel chapter 22. I'll show you what I'm talking about. The book of Ezekiel, 22. At the end of the Old Testament, you've got these three big, long prophetic books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Look at Ezekiel 22, 30. Because a lot of people have this attitude that if I don't do it, someone else is going to do it. God can just send someone else. God can just use someone else. Well, look at Ezekiel 22, 30. The Bible reads, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me, for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads. Say, Lord, now did God want to pour out his wrath? In this passage, Ezekiel 22, no. Did he want to pour out his wrath with fire? Did he want to recompense their own way of that? No, he was actually looking for some man that would stand up and stand in the head, stand in the gap, before the people so that they'd not be destroyed. But the problem was he found none. If you remember in Ezekiel, or not Ezekiel, Exodus chapter 33, God came to the same point with the children of Israel as he did in Ezekiel 22, where he basically said, I'm going to destroy the nation of Israel. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to finish them off right here in the wilderness. And remember, one man stood in the hedge. One man made up the gap. And Moses stood before God, pleaded with God for the lives of the people, and the Bible says that God repented of the evil that he thought that he was going to do unto the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 33. Why? Because one man stood up and made the difference. Here he sought for a man and found none. They ended up being destroyed. They ended up going into captivity. And that's what Ezekiel's talking about. When they went into captivity to Babylon, whereas in Moses' day there was a man, and there was only one man that God could have used to bring them out of the land of Egypt. He chose him. He ordained him. He sanctified him. Look at Jeremiah. You're in Ezekiel 22. Just go back a few pages to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1. You see, God is sending you. God is sending me to do a great work for him. And we can't have this attitude of send someone else because there is no one else. That's what you need to understand. Look at Jeremiah, chapter 1. I'll show you what I'm talking about. It says in verse 4, then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. What does sanctified mean? He set him apart. He said, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet under the nations. Now listen to Jeremiah begin to make excuses. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have set thee this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. You see, God chose a specific 
man, Jeremiah, to do a specific job for him. He chose this man and he said, look, if you don't do this, no one's going to do it. You see, we, we often think that we're just expendable, right? Like, well, I'm just expendable. I can be replaced. You know, and, and look, Christians cannot be replaced. No member of this church can be replaced. It's not just, well, you know, we have 40 people, and so if we lose five, we just get five more, and then we still have four. No! Every single person is unique. Every single person is an individual. No two human beings are the same. Hey, God creates every person different in their mother's womb. It's not just an accident of genetics or this person's DNA and this person's DNA. No, God creates life. And the Bible said in Psalm 139 that David said he was fashioned and formed in his mother's womb. He said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Hey, two people in this world are not exactly the same. God made everyone different and you and I are not expendable. We're not just like the parts of a washing machine or something where if it goes bad, we just replace it with the same bolt or replace it with the same screw or replace it with the same nut. No, we need, this nut cannot be replaced, okay? <laughs> you know, hey, I'm telling you, none of us can be replaced. And if, if, just tell, I tell you something, when you say send someone else, there is no one else. God has a special work that he has for you to do and it's different than what I'm going to do and I can't do your work and you can't do my work. For example... I could go and talk to somebody and take my Bible and want to give them the gospel and tell them how to be saved. He may not like my personality. He might not like my face. He might just not relate to me. We might just have a different personality. Now look, does that make him a bad person just because he doesn't like me? No. Okay, and then there could be, what do you mean no? <laughs> anyway, you know, no, it doesn't. Okay, he might not like me. Okay, but if you went and talked to him, he likes you. You know, because you're different than me. And then there are other people that would, that would like me that would not like you. Or maybe they would listen to me that would not listen to you, or vice versa. And that's why God has to use each and every one of us in a different way to reach different people. And so we can't just say, we'll send somebody else. There is no one else just like you. I mean, can you imagine who would have stepped in and been Moses? Moses, the meekest man upon the face of the earth, the Bible says. A man mighty in words and deeds. A man learned in all the learning of the land of Egypt, but then he also spent 40 years in the wilderness with God, he didn't know God for 40 years. I mean, this man was a unique person. He can't just be replaced. And that's why God became angry when for the fifth time he sent somebody else. I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. God said, you must do it. You are the one that's going to deliver the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And so we got to keep this in mind. Flip back to Isaiah chapter 6. We're in Jeremiah. Just go back one book to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. And, and you know where a lot of this comes from? It's Calvinism. You know, this idea that God's in heaven pulling all the strings, that we're all a bunch of puppets on the strings, and it's just simply not true. And this Calvinist doctrine teaches, well, if you don't, God's going to get it done. You know, he'll, he'll find a way to get it. He'll just, if it's not you, he'll just use somebody else, and, and blah, blah, blah. That flies in the face of this. I saw for a man, I found none. I wanted to save him, I wanted to help him, but I couldn't find anybody. You know, Calvinism is false doctrine. You right. say, are, are, you a, are you a five point Calvinist, a three point Calvinist? I'm not a Calvinist, pentagram, triangle, line. I'm a zero point Calvinist. Just draw a circle. That's what kind of Calvinist I am. No points at all. Because I don't believe in total depravity of man. I believe that man is a sinner. But I don't believe that man is unable to believe on Christ. The Bible says that God has given to every man the measure of faith. Every person is able to believe on Christ. Jesus said, you will not come to me that you might have life. I don't believe in the total depravity. I don't believe that a man does everything wrong in his life. Did you know that there are even unsaved people who do some things right some of the time? Who believes that? I mean, obviously an unsaved person might do something nice or do something right. It doesn't mean that they're not a sinner. They're still ungodly. They're still going to go to hell if they don't believe on Christ. But they're not totally depraved or they're unable to do right. Unconditional election. There is a condition. Right. If... If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And Philip and the eunuch answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God. Now, you know, I got a computer programmer in the front row. He knows what conditions are. If, then. Okay? If, comma, then. That's a condition. If thou shalt believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. So there's a condition to your salvation. It's not unconditional. There's a condition. Believe. There's only one condition. Faith. Limited atonement. Nope. He's the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. 
So he's the savior of those who do not believe, but it's not going to do him any good. Hey, the word was preached unto them as well as unto us. Howbeit the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Okay, so it's preached to everyone. He's the savior of all, but he's only going to be uh, effective to get you to heaven when you believe on him. And the blood is applied to the spiritual doorposts of your heart as it was in the Passover in Exodus chapter 12. Uh, irresistible grace is the other point of... Uh, of Calvinism, you know, like you're just drawn to it, you know, like it's irresistible. Oh, I don't, oh, you know, I just, I must get saved. Then why does Stephen say in the same chapter we just read, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. It's possible to resist God's Spirit, to quench the Holy Spirit, to grieve the Spirit, to resist the call to salvation. He called, he said in Proverbs 1, he said, I called and you refused. I stretched out my hand and no man regarded. Hey, that's a resistance to God's calling. God's, and they say, oh, you know, but God chooses. You know, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. He said, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you to bring forth fruit. He said, I've ordained you, I've chosen you to bring forth fruit fruit and that your fruit should remain but he was talking to 12 people and guess what one of them was a devil he said have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil so he didn't choose them for salvation he chose them to be his disciples and one of them turned out to be an unsaved devil so that can't be talking about salvation he said have not I chosen you 12 John chapter 6 and one of you is a devil perseverance of the saints perseverance of the saints you say oh that's eternal security right wrong it's the opposite I believe in the preservation of the saints. Uh, preserve, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, Jude 1.1, 1, 1, and preserved in Jesus Christ. And called, hey, I'm preserved in Jesus Christ. I don't have to persevere to the end to be saved. Hey, I already done been saved. I'm preserved in Christ. Preserved in God the Father. God is holding me in His hand. He said, no man can pluck Him out of my hand. I'm saved eternally, secure. Nothing can change that. As far as the east is from the west, God has separated me from my sins. Hey, I don't have to persevere to be saved. Amen. Did Lot persevere to the end? Yeah, he was saved. Did Samson persevere to the end? Nope, but he was saved. Did Noah persevere to the end? Nope, but he was saved. Look at all the people in the Bible who dropped the ball and yet were saved. Look at Peter becoming backslidden and denying that he even knows Jesus Christ. And yet he was saved. And so, you know, you don't have to persevere at the end to be saved. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Uh, the Bible says that if, if they endure to the end, their flesh would be saved in Matthew 24. And that's where people, they, they mix that up with their spirit being saved. You know, he says there should no flesh be saved, except those days should be shortened. And if you endure to the end of the tribulation, you know, you'd be saved by the rapture. That's all that's saying. Look at Isaiah. Did I even turn to Isaiah? Look at Isaiah. I love this verse, Isaiah 6, 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Who wants to go is what he's saying. Who are we going to send? Who wants to go? Who will go for us? Who's willing to go? He says, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Not send someone else. Not somebody else is going to do it. But this ought to be our answer. Hey, God, I will do it. Here am I. Send me. Look at Amos 7. Or in Isaiah, just go toward the end of the Old Testament. Before you get to Matthew, you'll get to the 12 small minor prophets. Look at Amos chapter 7. Amos, if, if you're not familiar with uh, the book of Amos, Amos was a prophet that preached in the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes. If you remember at this time in history, the, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom of Israel had been, become fractured after Solomon, you know, his son Rehoboam, basically took the two southern tribes. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, took the ten northern tribes. Well, if you know anything about 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, which one was the more wicked of the two? The northern or the southern? The northern. The northern hardly ever had a good king. They hardly ever were worshiping the Lord. It was usually always the southern kingdom that kind of was the more spiritual, the more righteous. They had some bad kings, but usually they were preaching the truth and, and had good kings. So Amos was a prophet. Isaiah was preaching to the, to the southern kingdom. Jer Jeremiah, Ezekiel, preaching to the southern kingdom. Okay, predominantly. But Amos was a, was a prophet to this northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, so he's, he's preaching to a rough crowd. I mean, these people don't want to hear what he has to say. Well, look at chapter 7, verse 12. 
And Amaziah, now Amaziah was the king of the northern kingdom at this time of Israel. Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah. So he's trying to send him to the southern kingdom. He's like, get out of here. We don't want to hear what you have to preach in our country. He said, uh, you know, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. So we could probably, a modern day parallel, would be like preaching in America today, where there are a lot of people who are saved, and there are a lot of people who believe the Bible, versus being in a country that's maybe like a Muslim country, or being in a country that was very atheistic, or Buddhist, or something. They're trying to send them back, you know, they're saying, hey, go to the land of Judah, and eat bread, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again anymore at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. So he's going right up to where the king lives, right in the capital city, and just preaching this stuff. And nobody wants to hear him. He says in verse 14, Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. He's saying, look, I wasn't a prophet's son. It's not, this isn't what I always wanted to do, or this is what, what I was raised to do or born to do. Hey, God sent me to do this job, and I said, here am I, send me. I'm going to go where God wants me to go. I'm going to preach what he tells me to preach. I'm not going to let you or anyone else stop me. Did the, did the children of Israel want Moses? No. He tried to, to, to start something, and they, they rejected it. He came back 40 years later. He was supposed to bring the elders of the children of Israel with him to go speak with Pharaoh. He ends up going and speaking to Pharaoh. And what happened? The elders of Israel got angry at Moses and said, Oh man, now we have it even worse. Now Pharaoh's mad. And they got angry at Moses. They, at, at some point, they wanted to kill Moses and Aaron. They didn't want it. But it didn't matter whether the people wanted him. It didn't matter whether Israel wanted Amos. It didn't matter whether the, the Jews wanted Moses. Hey, it's who God sent and no one else could have done that job except him. Look, if you would, at Matthew chapter 9. You see, Calvinism says God's pulling the strings up in heaven, and if you, if you fall out of place, he'll just put somebody else in your spot. Wrong. No, there's only one person that can do the job that you're called to do, and that's you. And God is ready to use anybody and everybody who's willing to step up to the plate. He just says, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And he said, he's looking for somebody to say, here am I, send me. Look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Look back at Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to see Jesus calling people to follow him. And he wants to do the following. See, see, here's what I'm trying to express to you this morning. Is that God wants to send you, personally. You say, well, he can only send Moses, so he's not looking for volunteers. He just picks certain people like Moses and Amos, you know, a Jeremiah. No, you're missing the point of the sermon. Yes, God does pick, pick specific people for specific jobs. Like Moses had to be the one, you know. He was the perfect guy to go down and, and uh, lead the children of Israel. Amos was the, was the perfect man, even though he didn't think so, even though others didn't think so. He had this calling on his life. He thought, hey, he's just gathering sycamore fruit. He's just herding a bunch of sheep. But God said, no, you are going to do great things for me. Thank God he wasn't still gathering a bunch of I don't even know what sycamore fruit is. <laughs> you, you know, he's gathering a bunch of sycamore fruit. You know, that, and that's what your, is that what your life is going to be? Just go gather a bunch of fruit that nobody's even heard of? When you could be preaching the truth? When you could be preaching God's word, getting people saved? But basically, yes, God picks a specific person for this, a specific person for that. But guess what? He picks everyone for something. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. And so whatever God wants you to do, whatever calling is on your life, hey, no one else can fulfill that. And so if you decide to quit the church, if you decide to go out and just drink and party and just have a good time and live it up and forget the Bible, forget soul winning, who's going to do your job? Who's going to talk to the people that you were supposed to talk to? Who's going to fill your place in this church? Or in another you know, like-minded, Bible-believing church? You see, you're not expendable. You're part of the team. You're a crucial part of God's plan, no matter who you are. He didn't just call Moses and just call him. No, he's calling to all of us. 
He's calling to everyone, saying, who will go for us? And he's looking for somebody to say, here am I, send me. He wants God to send laborers into the harvest, but so many people are not answering God's call. He's seeking for a man, he's not finding one. Look at Matthew 4, 19. This is when, he comes to, uh, this is when Jesus comes to Simon and Andrew, and he saith unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. He said, if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. That offer is still open today to anyone. He'll offer that to you, he'll offer that to me. He says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. If you follow him, you will be a solar. You will get people saved if you're really following Jesus. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him, the Bible says. And so, if you've never won somebody to Christ, hey, boy, it's time to follow Jesus a little more closely. Because if you follow him, don't tell me you follow him your whole life and he never made you a fisher of men. That's not what the Bible says. He said, if you follow me, I will make you. Not I might. I will make you fishers of men. Now let's look at chapter 8. Now these are, that was the positive example of chapter 4, where, where he called people to follow him. He said, I want to make you fish of men. And they, come on, they dropped everything. They immediately, they dropped the net. They left the ship. They left dad behind. And they said, we'll follow you. But look at chapter 8. We'll see some people who didn't follow him. Because, see, God's calling, but some people answer his call and some people refuse. Look at chapter 8, verse 9. And a certain scribe came and said to him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Now, again, the word will, you know, we, we don't really talk this way today in America in 2009. But, it, but in, in English, you know, the shall and the will are a little different, right? I'll forget it. But he's saying, hey, I, I will, he's like, I'm going to do this. Okay? I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So what's he saying? He's saying, Well, okay, you can follow me if you want, but I don't even know where I'm sleeping tonight. I could be sleeping outside, you know, I don't, I don't have a place to stay. And then look what it says next. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And it's, it's interesting because you, as you study this and you see what happens on the other side, guess who went with him? Just the 12 disciples. So these two guys didn't go. Because if you study this out and read the passage, when he gets to the other side where he goes to the demon possessed man, hey, these guys didn't come along. It was just the 12 disciples that came along. So not everybody whom Jesus calls comes along. Look at Matthew 9, 9. You're in chapter 8. Just flip one page over. Matthew 9, 9. And as Jesus passed forth from this, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. So he works for the IRS. It said, uh, and he saith unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. So here's another guy. Dropped everything and followed him. Look at chapter 16, verse 24. And here's the key right here. This is the key verse. Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man... Because you say, oh, he's just calling specific people, right? Just certain people he was inviting to follow him. No, he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Hey, Jesus is looking for anybody to follow him. He says, anyone who wants to follow me, just deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. Numbers 11.29, you don't have to turn there, but it says, And Moses said unto him, this is Moses speaking, Envious thou for my sake, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. He said God wants all of his people to be prophets, and that God's spirit would rest mightily upon every single one of them. Hey, God said, if any man will follow me, Anybody can be a fisher of man. Anybody can be used by God. Everybody should be filled with the Spirit of God. Everybody should be preaching God's Word. Everybody should be... And you say, well, I'm not going to be a pastor. No, it didn't say everybody should be a pastor. It didn't say everybody should be a leader or a pastor or a preacher or a bishop. No, it said that everyone should preach God's Word. Like preach the gospel to every creature. Every man, woman, boy, and girl can take the Bible and go to someone one-on-one -on -one and preach the gospel to that person and see them saved. That's for everybody. All God's people. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You're in Matthew. You just go uh, to the end of the Bible. 
about halfway through the New Testament. Look at First Corinthians or Second Corinthians chapter four. And let me make just two applications to this to this truth to this idea. The first application of it is this: if you don't answer God's call to be a fisher of men, if you don't answer God's call to go out and give the gospel and see people saved, no one will fill your place. And I'm going to show you that in the Bible. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Do you see that? If we hide, you know, he said, of course, that we shouldn't take a light and hide under a bushel, remember? But he said, you know, remember the song when you're a kid? This is a light of mine. Hide it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. Who sang that song when you're a kid? All right. Some people have let it shine, let it shine. <laughs> but anyway, okay, he said, you know, no man take a candle and, and hide it under a bushel, but he said, but set it on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. He's saying, hey, the, God, the glorious light of the gospel needs to shine forth. You need to open your mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. He's saying, but if it be hid, let's say you do hide it under a bushel. He said, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. But is it shining unto them? Well, that depends upon you. Because if your gospel be hid, they will still be blinded, and that glorious light of the gospel will not shine in and illuminate and enlighten them to where they can believe on Christ and be saved. No, they'll still go on being blinded. They'll still go on being lied to in, in a church that's telling them, work your way to heaven. They'll still go on to see unless your light shines and breaks through. That's what he said. He said, unless the glorious light of the gospel should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Put back to 1 Corinthians, that's 2 Corinthians. Let's go back a few pages to 1 Corinthians 3, 5. You say, well, people are going to get saved, they're going to get saved. If they're not, they're not. No. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. We better shine that light of the gospel or they're going to remain in darkness. Let's face it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is a really interesting verse. It says in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom he believed, watch this, even as the Lord gave to every man. So what's that, what's that verse teach? Read it again. It says, it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. So what, is the, what did God give to every man? According to this verse. A minister by whom they might believe. A Paul, an Apollos, a Stephen, a Matthew, whoever, that's going to come to them and preach it to them. Right? Now, does every single person in this world who is born and dies have someone in their life at some time or another come to them and give them a clear presentation of the gospel from the Bible. No. I mean, everybody in this world has at least heard something about Jesus. They've heard verses from the Bible. I mean, even just verses that are quoted in our popular culture. You know, we hear verses. We hear about Jesus. We hear about God. Even, even I've talked to people. I talked to a guy. It's funny one time. I talked to a guy who, who lived in India. <clears throat> and I gave him the gospel. I showed him how to be saved. He said, you know, man, I can't believe that, that you have to believe in Jesus to be saved. He's like... Where I'm from, people never even heard of Jesus. So I said, I said, come on, are you serious? In India, you've never heard of Jesus? You know who Jesus Christ is? He's like, man. He said, I was 10 years old before somebody told me about Jesus. <laughs> and he's like, and I didn't even learn like the whole story about the Bible and everything about he's crucified until I got to high school. You know, he's trying to tell me he's living in some place where nobody knows about Jesus. And it was taught to him in school. When he was 16, you know? And even before that, he heard about it as a child. But then when he was 16... Look, there, there are kids in, in America today who don't know anything about Jesus. I mean, it's amazing. It's changed. Since I started knocking doors and, and giving people the gospel of those souls when I was uh, just right when I turned 17 years old, which is about, you know, almost 11 years ago now. 
because I'm, I'm almost 28. And I remember uh, you'd knock on the door and you'd, you'd talk to people, give them the gospel. And you'd say to them, you know, you'd talk about Jesus dying on the cross and explain all that. And then you'd say, what happened three days later? And everybody would say, he rose again. Right? Everybody knew that part of the story. Nowadays, you say, what happened three days later? What do they say? I don't know what happened. How many people have been out sowing and had people say that a lot? I don't know what happened. <laughs> You're right. He rose again. And you'll say, you know Adam and Eve? You're right. No. I mean, I'm constantly running into teenagers and young adults who don't know who Adam and Eve are. It literally. I'm like, you've never heard of Adam and Eve? No. Jonah. Remember Jonah, the whale? No. Samson. Remember Samson? You know, the strength and everything? Never heard. Noah. Remember Noah and the ark and the animals? Nope. It's true. And look, people in India or people, you know, people down here, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing. I mean, there are people everywhere who haven't heard the gospel. There are people everywhere who don't know the truth. Why? Because you're sitting around and not giving it to them. That's why. Because you're not going to, because your gospel will be hit. That's why. And you expect somebody else to do it, though. Because everybody, I guarantee you, that every single Christian who, who is, who, whose gospel is hit, who never gives the gospel to anybody, nobody at work, nobody in your family, nobody at school, nobody door to door, nobody you know, you don't give people the gospel, I guarantee you, you want other people to give them the gospel. I mean, if I said to you, do you want someone, would you like for someone to go tell your, your mom how to be saved, or your brother how to be saved, or your, your co-worker how to be saved? No. I mean, you say, yeah, oh yeah, sure. Absolutely, it'd be great. Oh man, it'd be great if somebody talked to my aunt or my uncle. Boy, it'd be great if somebody come to my job and, and give the gospel to everybody on the job. You expect someone else to do it. But wait a minute, maybe God's will, maybe the minister by whom those people should believe, maybe you're the one that he chose. Maybe he's sending you to talk to that person. And if you don't talk to him, you know, and, and, and by the way, most people, there's more than one person that's going to talk to them in their life. You know, somebody kind of plants. Sometimes you talk to somebody who's planting a seed. And other times somebody comes and waters it. Somebody else finally gets to reap the increase. But if you think about it, I mean, I've had, I've had many people talk to me and, and give me the gospel throughout my life. You know, I got saved at a very young age. But even after I was saved, there were there have been Baptists who knocked on my door. There have been uh, just people at work who tried to evangelize me. And I told them, hey, I'm already saved. You know, I'm, I'm going to heaven. And I explained that to them. Well, wait a minute. There are so many people today who are not answering the call. There are so many people that the gospel is being hid to a lot of people. And there are people out there who would be saved if you would persuade them, if you would compel them, if you would preach it to them, if you would give them the gospel. You say, oh, I don't think you should be persuasive. I don't think you should be compelling. What happened when Paul preached to King Agrippa? What did he say? Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He said, wow. Because he preached such a powerful sermon to him. He said, wow, you've almost convinced me into being a Christian myself. And Paul said, boy, I wish it wasn't almost. I wish it'd be altogether, is what his answer was. He said, don't tell me almost. He said, altogether. He said, I wish that thou were not all, you know, almost as I am, but altogether as I am, except for these bonds, you know, except the handcuffs, you know. I, I, that's what he told him. That's what he told King Herbert. He said, I wish you'd be just like me, except without these handcuffs on. You know, because he's preaching to him in bonds. He's preaching the gospel to him. He's in jail for, for what? For preaching? And yet he said, I want to preach the gospel boldly even in my bonds. And so uh, that's what we need. Somebody who's willing to do it themselves. Don't rely on someone else. You've got to do it yourself. I already covered these verses. These are some verses that I was going to cover. But let, let's turn to one last place. Deuteronomy 6. We've got to tie this in with Father's Day because... You know, it's Father's Day. One thing about being a preacher is like, you can get a sermon you want to preach, and then somebody's like, oh, remember, it's this holiday. You're like, oh. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I have my sermon all ready to go. And it's like, it's Mother's Day. Oh, man, you know, i got to write the Mother's Sermon. But like, the Mother's Day sermon, you have to preach, or else you're going to get busted. <laughs> right? But like, the Father's Day sermon, you can get by with not. You know what I mean? Because no one <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to care. You know, another. I mean, is anybody in here like, man, I needed a Father's Day? <laughs> a Mother's Day, woe, woe unto you. You don't know, you know, preach that Mother's Day sermon. You're going to be busted. So, but I'm, I'm going I'm to throw you a bone and tie in uh, Father's Day. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
Now, before I read this to you real quick, let me just explain to you something about the Bible, something about the King James Bible. And that's the difference between the word thou and ye. Okay? Everybody criticizes the King James Bible and says, oh man, I can't understand the these and the thous. It's like, look, it means you. Alright? Pretty hard. But you know, people get so hung up on that. Man, I've got to get a Bible without the these and the thous. It's like they can't translate this one word. Thou, you. Okay? But the these and the thous are important. Because if you take away the these and the thous, you lose the meaning of over a thousand passages in the Bible. You lose the exact meaning. Like, you would be mixed up when you read it. And here's why. Because thou is singular and ye is plural. And there are over a thousand places where that alters. You could, you could basically get a, a wrong message of what Jesus or someone else is saying. Like, for example, when, when Jesus said to Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you. Plural or singular? You. Plural. You is plural, me is singular. Okay, so basically he says, Satan has desired to have you. So is he saying Satan has desired to have Peter, or Satan has desired to have the whole group? The whole disciples, what he said. Satan has desired to have you, but I have prayed for thee. Singular or plural? Singular. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Okay, so there's a big difference there, because if you were reading it... Okay, see what I mean? Oh, yeah, next person. No, shit. But anyway, uh, basically, if you were reading it in one of these modern versions that just says you, it would just say, Satan had desire to have you, but I prayed for you. You wouldn't understand. He's saying he's going to try to attack the whole group, but I prayed for you specifically to be the one who's going to stand up and take the lead, which he did at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, which he did in Acts chapter 1. Here's another good example. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, he must be born again. Right? Everybody has to be born again, but he's saying it to one person. And he, you know, when he's telling Nicodemus, he said, he's basically saying he showed him these earthly things. He said, and ye believe not. So he's not rebuking Nicodemus specifically for not believing. He's basically rebuking the Pharisees as a whole. Ye believe not. And on and on. I mean, just all throughout the Bible, a thousand times, you get a different gist. And here's another one of those thousand times that dramatically changes the meaning. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Talk about learning the Bible, right? And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Now, is that singular or plural? Singular. Thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So whose responsibility is it to teach their children the Bible? Somebody else, right? That's what church is for, right? That's what the Christian school is for. Oh, don't even get me started on that. Uh, that's what, you know, vacation Bible school is for, right? Or this uncle, or this cousin, or this brother, or, you know, hey, thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children. And let's talk to the dad, because it's Father's Day. Don't rely on anyone else. Take this as your personal command from God, in the singular form, telling you specifically, Dad, it is your job to raise your children and to teach them the Bible. You know, as dad, I'm not even just totally going to rely on mom. Mom's not going to totally rely on me. Hey, we each need to take it as a responsibility to train up our children in the way that they should go. You see, today people don't want to raise their own children. It's Father's Day, but, but sadly today, most children spend very little time with their parents. Because they're dropped out at a government school to raise their child for them. Or a Christian school, so-called, to raise their child for them. And we've lost the, the, the teaching and training that can only come from a parent. We spend millions and billions of dollars. And you know, if a politician wants to get elected, here's all they have to say. Put our children first. Yeah. <sighs> you know what I mean, right? It's the next generation. <sighs> More funding for schools. <sighs> support our teachers. I don't want to support teachers. Amen. I want to spend my own money and raise my own kid. 
It's America. It's what America is supposed to be about. Freedom. I want to have somebody take my money away and use it to raise somebody else's kid? And then, and then i got to spend more money to like make sure that their kid doesn't get on drugs while it's in school. Because that's where all the drugs are being circulated, right? So I get the first I pay to take all the kids out of the home and have them trained by somebody that I'm hired with my tax dollars. Somebody else is going to raise the kid. Then i got to spend you know, millions of dollars on a war on drugs so that we can make sure that your kid doesn't get on drugs. My kids aren't going to get on drugs because I raise my children myself. I'm going to teach them myself. My wife is going to teach them herself. And so we don't need to rely on someone else to raise our children. God gave you your children. You need to spend the time to raise them. And you know what? We can all get busy with everything else sometimes. Get busy with work. Get busy serving God even. You get busy with everything. But you better take the time necessary to spend quality time teaching and training your children. And don't rely on someone else to do it. So, oh, my kids go to Faith for Work Baptist Church. They're guaranteed to turn out right. Wrong. One hour on Sunday morning, an hour on Sunday night, an hour on Wednesday night, it's not going to cut it. It's you that's with them day after day. It's you that's with them day in and day out. You better take responsibility and teach your children the Bible. Mom, teach your children the Bible. Proverbs 31 was a mother teaching her son the Bible. All throughout the Bible, fathers are instructed to teach the Word of God to their children. To teach, and also just wisdom, knowledge, instruction. Practical things. Train and teach your children. Don't rely on someone else. Don't rely on someone else to give the gospel for you. Don't rely on hey, rely upon God's calling upon your life. Rely on the strengths that God has given you. God gave you the talent. Moses said, I can't do it. I don't have the ability. <clears throat> but I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me. This is what Paul said. But I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me. For that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. When God calls you to do some work for him, he enables you. When he gives you children, he'll give you the ability, if you'll be faithful, if you'll follow him, he'll give you the ability to raise those children. He'll give you the ability to give the gospel, because if he's commanded you to do it, he's calling you to preach the gospel and to preach it, to be a light of the world, he'll enable you to do it. He'll give you the ability to do it. You've just got to be willing to say, here am I, send me. Not someone else, me. I'll do it. I'll take responsibility. Because everybody thinks it's somebody else's job and then it just never gets done. But when every single person takes responsibility and says, I will take it upon myself. I will fight the good fight. I will preach the word of God. I will raise my children and I'm not going to rely on anyone else but the Lord to give me the strength to do it myself. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father, please just help this message to sink down into our ears. Help us not to... To always want to just expect other people to do it for us, dear God. Help us to be the one that will give the gospel. Help us to be the one to raise our children and make sure that they get trained in the things of God and turn out right. We love you and thank you so much for saving us and calling us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to your own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We have that purpose. We're saved. We have a purpose. But God forbid we would be like so many who walk away from that purpose, who don't fulfill your will for our lives, who don't fulfill God's purpose, and basically our gospel ends up being hid to those that are lost. Please just bless us now and, and strengthen us and, and help us to answer your call on our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.